Uh, wow, what an incredible panel. Uh, to that end, we want to encourage uh, you to support their work, um, the work that our young uh, sisters and women of color are doing uh, on the front lines to liberate uh, all of us. We are uh, preparing to transition to this next session. And uh, as we begin this next session, we want to just invite um, Britton Smith up to help greet us as we transition to this next session, Power to the People, a policy agenda for Black America. Hi, Britton. What's up, New? <laughs> What's going on, good brother? Uh, how you doing today, Reverend Green? Awesome, man. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, just talk to us about reform, man, and thank you for being a part of this conversation with us today. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have the pleasure of serving uh, Reform Alliance as its uh, senior organizing strategist. And Reform Alliance is uh, Meek Mill's criminal justice organization group, um, specifically designed around probation and parole reform. We know that that's an area of criminal justice reform that needs special attention. Um, it's a lot of focus that we talk about for various aspects and various areas of justice reform, but if we don't address those issues that keep us engaging and increasing technical violations and negative interaction, uh, then we won't be able to solve the problem of police reform, justice reform holistically. Well, thank you, brother. We appreciate you for that, man, and look forward to continuing to uh, follow the work for Reform Alliance and thanks to our dear brother Van Jones and all of those who are working actively engaged in criminal justice reform. We'll see you later, absolutely. brother. Absolutely, Thanks. absolutely. Thank you, man. Awesome. We are uh, preparing for uh, this uh, next panel, Power to the People, a policy agenda for Black America. But as we are preparing for this, we want to just take a time to uh, let you know about a special session happening uh, to the left or to my right, whichever where you are on the and hopping platform. Uh, um, there is a special Juneteenth cooking demonstration that will happen at two o'clock p.m. So if you are preparing for lunch, uh, you can go ahead and, and watch with our chef Diambra as she cooks a very special uh, meal for us today uh, on this Juneteenth holiday. We want to also mention that we want you to keep up with what's happening with Justice Con and Greater Allen Cathedral and Faith for Black Lives. Please text three uh, Justice Con to three one nine nine six to stay updated. Uh, text uh, Justice Con at three one nine nine six. And with that being said, we're excited to bring on Sister Raquel Jones, who is the program manager of the Young Elected Officials Network. Yeah. Hi, Raquel. Hi, how are you? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Welcome. We look forward to this panel and we look forward to uh, uh, all of the panelists in this awesome conversation that we're getting ready to have. Thank you. I'll see you all soon. Thank you, Reverend Green. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm really excited about all the conversations that are being had today in celebration of Juneteenth and all things Black liberation. Um, but right now we're going to go into a conversation around setting a Black policy agenda. Um, and if you've been listening in, you know that there's power in policy, but the diversity of the Black community and its wide ranging needs make it feel difficult to rally around a collective policy agenda. So in reality, the shared experience of systemic racism is the common thread that binds our demands together. So this session will highlight pressing policy issues, including health, education, public safety, and economic empowerment, and really discuss a political strategy um, needed to advance pol a policy agenda for Black America. Um, and so joining me today are Dr. Oliver Brooks, president of the National Medical Association, Dr. Delman Coates, senior pastor at Mount and Inn Baptist Church, Reverend Regina Thomas, Woman, Human and Civil Rights Advocacy Director for American Federation of Teachers, and Patrice Cullors, artist, political strategist, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, and founder of Reform LA Jails. Um, and then I am Raquel Jones, Program Manager at the Young Elected Officials Network, who will be your moderator for the hour. Um, so welcome to all of our panelists. Um, thank you for being here and happy Juneteenth. Thank you. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Thank June. You. Thank you. So let's go ahead and, and dive in. I really want to open the conversation up by just going ahead and diving into um, how we begin to create an agenda. 
So to all of you all, we know that there are so many issues plaguing the Black communities. Um, so based on your respective roles and work um, that you all do, how would you each say we should approach creating a political agenda that encompasses the broad scope of the needs of our Black communities? I can start, um, if that's OK with you, Raquel. Please. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us today. This is a very fancy setup. I've been used to the Zoom setup, so very impressed with this interface. Um, and I, what I'll say is that one of the things that uh, lead us um, inside of the Black Lives Matter movement and the larger movement for Black lives is looking at what people on the ground want. Um, we have to build policy agenda, agendas that are bold and courageous and that are leaning into what the community is asking for. And um, being uh, policy agendas that are willing to take risks and policy agendas that are um, have a, a big vision about where we're going. Um, as I'm thinking about Juneteenth and thinking about the freedom for black people and how um, our freedom has de been determined based off of legislation, then what kind of legislation do we need to build out so that we can have the fullest freedom and space in this country? And so that's kind of the framework in which um, I think about um, building out policy agendas. If I may speak next. First, I want to endorse what you said. I also want to say that we need to hang in there, brother, because we've been we're following some strong sisters. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm hearing all this about black women. I, black men know black women are strong. OK, we're married to them. We have them as our daughters and our mothers. So uh, amen to that from that last panel. As it relates to a policy agenda, I think that we first of all need to do this. We need to get together and link each with each other and determine that we speak with, I won't say one voice, but with a, of singing in unison. Uh, the choir may be in harmony, but it's still on the same song. Uh, I believe that there are policies that are already being advocated for that we can get behind as, as a physician and as president of National Medical Association, we are pushing for universal health care. That is critically important. A lot of the issues that we see are because people just don't have good access to health care. African Americans are uninsured at a rate of anywhere from 11 to 20 percent. Uh, the white population, 8 to 11 percent. So we're, we're underinsured or uninsured. And another thing that I would look at would be right now there's the HEROES Act. The HEROES Act was passed by the, uh, the uh, House on May 15th. It has many great uh, provisions, $6,000 to a family, uh, there's $100 billion to, to Hospital 7.6, to HRSA, which supports uh, community health centers. So pushing agendas such as that that are already out there, and if we all speak together on that, things like that will happen. I want to thank um, Dr. Brooks for for highlighting sort of the HEROES Act. Working for the American Federation of Teachers, the one concern that we have is making sure that there's enough monies in states to uh, for schools to come back um, as the way they're supposed to be. Uh, the pandemic created an op opportunities for online learning in many of our communities. There is a digital divide. And lo and behold, if there's more than one child uh, in the household and there's one computer. And so not only do you have a digital divide, but then you have access to that. And if you have parents that are trying to do online working as well as children trying to get on. And so uh, I think it's important that we fight, as Dr. Brooks said, uh, for uh, the uh, stimulus package that is HEROES Act that is coming before us and that we are prepared when these children come back to school with all of this anger that is out there, our teachers must be equipped uh, for Black Lives Matter t-shirts and Black Lives Matter caps that these children would be be wearing in order uh, that they would be courageous fighters. And so uh, it's my advocacy that not only should you vote, but you also should vote for school board members so that we can continue to have access uh, for education for our youth. Education is pivotal. Our parents and grandparents fought for it. And so in addition to sort of education, in addition to voting to make sure that we continue to fight at every level to make sure that schools are safe places for our children. Um, 
Well, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I'm really honored and delighted to, to be with you today. Um, I just really wanna echo the comment that was made about we need really bold, risky ideas. Um, one of the things that I think is key in that regard as it relates to developing a policy agenda is to understand the one thing that links all of our issues. We need a unifying meta narrative that links us, whether we're interested and passionate about healthcare, education, employment, labor, environmental injustice, mass incarceration. And one of the things that I've found as a result of my work is that the one thing that links all of our various causes is the question of how are we gonna pay for all of these robust public policies? It is the foundational uh, question of public finance, how are we gonna pay for it? And one of the things that I found incredibly powerful is an understanding of modern monetary theory. It is a subset of the economics field that is really designed to help the public understand the power of deficit spending to address our greatest social and economic challenges. I would contend that we have been misled about the federal government's capacity to create money through deficit spending to address the range of issues we care about. We have often been told that the federal government needs a revenue stream first in order to spend, much like your household. But modern monetary theory and the range of economists who are connected with this help us to understand that the federal government is not like a household. It does not need revenue first in order to spend. We just saw that in the stimulus where the federal government created three and a half or so trillion dollars in a matter of weeks by utilizing the power of money creation to address our critical need at that moment. That power of money creation needs to be harnessed and utilized and appropriated to understand that there are no fiscal policy constraints short of inflation that prevent us from funding the range of policies that we care about. And so I've been leading a range of faith leaders to advocate the following policies. We critically need a federal job guarantee. At a time when over 44 million Americans are unemployed, when they're, we're dealing with underemployment and unemployment, the federal government, we, we need to have a public policy guarantee of employment. It is the unfinished work of the civil rights movement the March on Washington was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Coretta Scott King led 1.2 million people in rallies and marches in the 70s for a federal job guarantee. So we need a federal job guarantee. We need to have, in my, in my mind, single payer health care. Uh, we should not live in this society where people are literally afraid to go to their doctor, Dr. Brooks, or are going into bankruptcy for committing the crime of becoming ill. It is a travesty. It is a, a moral injustice. We should have single payer health care or Medicare for all. We need to address our greatest existential threat and fully fund a Green New Deal. In my mind, we need federal funding for public education, pre-K through college, including funding for HBCUs, because the major disparities we're finding in public education are connected to the funding mechanism of relying on state and local taxes to fund public education. Uh, and lastly, I would say, we need to fully fund the, the infrastructure uh, proposals of the American Society of Civil Engineers, saying that we need $4.6 trillion of infrastructure spending. That's the kind of spending that could create an incredible amount of jobs uh, in our country for families, for people who are dealing with income insecurity, and so um, I, I strongly recommend that advocates understand modern monetary theory because it's gonna help us to unleash the untapped potential of our economy to do exactly uh, what we need to do. If we're to have a just society, we must have a just money system. Thank you all for your perspectives. Um, I, I echo um, everything you all said, but I just add that I say this all the time, um, but I, and I know some people are sick of me saying it, but I truly believe that we really need the people closest to the pain or issues at the table creating this agenda. Um, so 
we really have to listen to the community in order to truly get an understanding of the broad scope of our needs. And so while federal legislative, a federal legislative agenda is absolutely necessary, um, especially around addressing policing, expanding Black economic equality, healthcare disparities, um, and education within Black communities, we know that policy is also felt um, at the state and local level. So for YL, the Young Elected Officials Network, the approach is doubling down on the work that we're already doing and supporting elected officials who are doing this work, right? Um, so for us, it's setting a framework to discuss policies that can to begin to root out systemic um, racism. And so looking at um, issues from food insecurities, lack of a living wage, to expanding health care access, to expanding Black economic equality, things that can happen right now at the local and state level um, that young electeds are pushing in their communities. Um, but we do also know that that's just one aspect. We know that elected representation isn't enough. Um, so we also need organizers to continue showing up. Um, we have to flood our local um, council meetings, build relationships with electeds who share our values. Um, and electeds are accountable to the people. So we have to um, show up and bring our voices to the table, but we also need electeds to do their jobs, right? Um, so bridging that gap of electeds and organizers and really building a, a shared analysis so we can move together is kind of the approach that we're taking at the Young Elected Officials Network. Um, but with that, um, Dr. Brooks, we know that systemic racism has you know, really had an incredibly damaging effect on Black health. Um, it's the reason Black mothers and babies are dying at alarming rates. Um, it's the reason COVID-19 is killing us disproportionately. Um, it's the reason that even when we seek medical care, our concerns and issues go unheard. Um, and as COVID-19 shined a spotlight on the health um, inequities we've become, um, we've been facing forever, can you talk to us about how we can use that spotlight to push for health policies that acknowledge and aim to undo systemic racism? COVID-19 unmasked a disparity that the NMA and our Black community knew was present for decades. So it didn't, COVID-19 did not create disparities, it unmasked them. You're more likely to die or get hospitalized from COVID-19 if you have diabetes, obesity, hypertension. Diabetes is 2.2 times more likely to be occurring in the African-American population. Hypertension, 20 to 40 percent higher. Obesity, somewhere around 30 percent higher. Why are we obese, hypertensive? Why? It's because social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are the number one indicator for your level of health, not your genetics and not the kind of care that you're getting. So therefore, to improve our outcomes, not just with COVID-19, but in general, we need actions that address that. You mentioned food insecurity. 22% of African-Americans are food insecure versus 12% of the uh, majority population. 71% of African Americans live within 30 miles of an area designated as the worst air. So we need policies to get us better housing, better food. Our wealth, where our net income for a black family is $17,000, for a white family, $170,000. That's called the wealth gap. I call it the health gap. Anything that improves the economic status of African-American people and families will directly improve our health and that has been studied. I'll also speak to racism. There are studies that show that when you factor out education, income, and housing, those all are the same for a black and a white person, black people have worse outcomes. It's because of racism, not race. We need implicit bias training and it's interesting, we're in a pandemic from COVID-19, which is an acute biologic pandemic. We got a chronic social pandemic called police brutality that we're also dealing with. And it leads into the concept of racism. So we need to address policies that reduce the effect of racism in our society. And that'll have a positive effect in all aspects, socioeconomic, health, psychology, uh, police brutality, which is physical death. 25 through 29 year olds, the sixth leading cause of death is at the hands of police. That's the truth of all. So this would help white people and black people. So those are the policies that myself and the NMA feel need to be acted upon to have better health outcomes. 
Thank you, Dr. Brooks. I really appreciate you you pointing out the health gap, but then also panning to police brutality. Um, that brings us to um, segueing into policing um, and creating an agenda around policing. So we know policing um, and the criminal justice system were never built around public safety. Um, understanding this, it is clear to me personally that abolishment is of the current system and reimagining what public safety looks like is the only way bad policing practices will stop plaguing our communities. Um, and I, but I credit this shift in, in my thinking from reform to abolishment to organizers like my friend Mercedes Fulbright in Dallas, Texas, and my colleague, um, CC battles at Young People Four. Um, so Patrice, as an organizer um, of Black Lives Matters and Reform LA Jails, defund the police campaigns offer a definitive policy agenda for urgent solutions to defund police departments across the US. Can you talk to us about key components of that agenda and how it has evolved since its original creation? And then can you elaborate a little bit on the defund strategy in relationship to policy at the local level? Absolutely. I think, you know, for so many people, when the defund movement began, there was a knee jerk reaction um, that this was impossible, that there was no way we can um, take money out of police budgets and put it towards social services. But what we've seen over the last 25 days since the Minneapolis uprising is that's completely untrue. Every single um, city across this country, and I argue across the globe, is re understanding and redefining what public safety looks like. And what we've seen public safety as over the last 30 years in particular um, is mostly an over bloated police budgets and over bloated jail and prison system budgets. And so we're in an opportunity right now where we get to have a different conversation. And where we start around policy is looking at police budgets. Um, I've, you know, for people who are watching on the screen, go back to your city, go back to your county, go back to your state and look at how much money is going into policing and incarceration. And then look at what's going into housing, look at what's going into access to adequate public education, adequate healthcare, and the disparity is so disturbing. And so what we're asking for is to actually analyze how police have been in our neighborhoods and in communities. What role have we given them that they actually should not be doing? Police should not be the first responders to mental health care. They should not be the first responders to homelessness. They should not be the first responders to drug and alcohol abuse. Police should not be in schools K through 12. And so we can just look at those four places and start to redefine, well, what should be there? Many of us are arguing case managers, uh, violence prevention workers, um, dare I say, art artists, um, and art and cultural programming. And so we can build a robust policy around um, taking a, giving the police less power and less money in our neighborhoods and communities. A great example of that is um, what's happening here in Los Angeles where I live, being led by the local chapter of Black Lives Matter called the People's Budget. The People's Budget was presented before the Minneapolis uprising and it was presented to the public before, but just this past week, um, members of Black Lives, La Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, led by Dr. Melina Abdullah, presented the budget to the city council. Let me tell you how moving it was to hear people from the community demand more. When we say defund, what we're actually saying is we want to reprioritize how our communities are, um, uh, repri reprioritize the dollars our communities are given and really lift our communities up um, because we deserve so much more than handcuffs, a jail cell, a badge and a gun. Thank you for, for pointing out some of the, the policy issues that we could be looking at. As a follow-up question, um, could you talk to what organizers and folks who, who want to become involved can do to be a part of, of advocating for changes? Yes, um, for so many folks right now, um, I heard that um, the books on abolition are sold out on Amazon. Um, uh, books like White Fragility are the number one uh, uh, number one New York Times bestseller, which is amazing. Um, there were years in this country, and many of our, our panelists can attest to this, where you said the word racism, people would cringe. Oh, why are we saying that? Why are we using that term? And now we are in this moment where we're not just saying racism, we're saying white supremacy. 
We are using words like police terror and police violence. Um, the, we have to have a real robust conversation about what is. And so there's so many groups um, that are doing that work. Uh, Black Lives Matter, um, the organization has chapters across the country so people can check that out at blacklivesmatter.com. You can join the chapter, but also the Movement for Black Lives, which is 150 plus organizations that are part of a coalition. Um, today, they're celebrating Juneteenth, um, both at the local level and international level. People are doing events across the country and the world because this now is the time where we have this huge opening to really shift the culture and shift what and shift policy. So join an organization and your and your um, local movement. I'm a big fan of um, doing the local work. So join your organization in whatever city you're in, and you can figure that out by um, looking at Movement for Black Lives um, or BlackLivesMatter.com. And then you know every single person on this panel, I'm pretty sure, has a ton of organizations that they think people should be joining. But that's my key message for people: join something. Do not do this alone. We cannot take this on alone. I know that everybody thinks Dr. Martin Luther King had a dream and he figured it out on his own. He did not. There were lots of people at his back. He had an entire organization and a coalition of people to help us get closer to freedom. May I add something to that? Yes, please. I think what just spoken by um, Ms. Colors is really important. Strike while the iron is hot. I mean, I think we need to have more dialogue. Start talking to your white friends. Um, I have people that I know that they're in, in, in the industry and in corporate life and the, the white individuals that they speak to now are really feeling something. This is this is a real moment. I think that we, we really need to understand that. And I don't want this to be a news cycle, a three month news cycle or a six month news cycle, a longer one. But we really need to act right now. Now, there is a rethinking what's going on of, of what she said in L.A. Now, they're looking at diverting the money. You look at the federal budget has 700 billion with a B going to the military. If they directed 100 billion with a B in other directions, we would be just as safe. We'd have six locks on the border instead of seven. So I think that focus on getting active. I will say I don't. I uh, recommend going out and protesting for those that are 65 and older with hypertension, okay? But the people have been asking that, what do we do? You do exactly what she said. I'd say, write a check, okay, if you can. Uh, retweet, support the politicians that have your best interests at heart, but talk to people. Right now, is it's a pregnant moment. Talk to people, especially people who don't normally agree with you. Don't preach to the choir. Preach to the anti-protesters. Thank you. I completely agree. I think right now we definitely need to continue having more di um, dialogue and then um, finding ways to, to be active. Um, and I appreciate you um, discussing diverting money. And that will lead me into Dr. Coates. Um, we know that economic inequalities continue to be a, a barrier to black freedom. Um, for every $1 that a white man makes, black men earn just 87 cents and black women earn just 61 cents. So for women, that's nearly a $1 million loss in a lifetime of earnings. Um, and it's no surprise that the racial wealth gap is just as wide today for black Americans as it was in 1968. What economic policies do we need to address critical inequalities such as the pay gap, discriminatory hiring practices, the labor share, and health and um, child care costs? Um, and I say this, I'm directing this question to Dr. Coates, but anyone, please feel free to jump in um, after he answers as well. Thank you for the question. And this is certainly an issue that I've focused on for quite some time. Um, I think if we're to address this question, we have to change the way in which right now we balance the economy on the backs of the unemployed. The way in which we do monetary policy causes our um, policymakers who focus on macroeconomics to literally balance the economy to, on the basis of interest rate policy, which means that we, will we are guaranteed to have 10 to 30 million Americans who are unemployed. You notice that whenever the unemployment rate dips too low, policymakers begin to do what? They begin to raise interest rates based on a flawed, outdated assumption that too much 
If we get too much to a full employment economy, then the inflationary target will be triggered. This has to end because those 10 to 30 million unemployed Americans, regardless of what we do at the local and state level, are going to be people who look like us. So we have to change the way in which we do monetary policy. And rather than manage the economy through interest rate policy, we have to have the policy I mentioned a moment ago, which is a federal job guarantee. There's no incentive right now for the private sector, corporations, to raise wages for an employee who makes, let's say, $12 an hour and wants $20 an hour if there's a huge cohort of unemployed people who are willing to take $9.75. We have to take that slack out of the economy to provide a floor to wages. And the way that you do that is that you have a federal policy where the federal government guarantees to provide public sector employment to people at every skill level for every American that wants one, a dignified job with benefits for every American that wants one. Once we have a floor to unemployment and we have a true full employment economy, not an economy where the Fed is chartered with maximizing unemployment and price stability, which is going to guarantee that you have tens of millions of unemployed people. I want to suggest and invite those listening to go to our website, OurMoneyUS.org. We launched an organization to educate activists, policymakers about modern monetary theory. It is critically important to help us to address the question of how we're going to pay for these robust spending proposals that have been discussed today. And I come from the perspective where I want to end systemic economic racism. And to do that, we need to ask for not the economic crumbs. We need to ask for the whole loaf. Yes, as Dr. Brooks said, yes, you could shift $100 billion from the military budget. But once you realize that the federal government doesn't have to rely on a fixed pie of money to fund its budget, that taxes don't fund spending, um, then you realize that the capacity and the potential to create money is not constrained by these outdated economic assumptions that cause the public policymakers and activists to assume that the federal government is operating within a limited fiscal policy pie. It is not. We can fund Medicare for all to the tune of $30 trillion over 10 years. We can fund the range of priorities that we have talked about today. And while there may be legitimate needs to reduce our military budget, to reduce the amount of uh, money that local and state governments allocate to spending, that in order to then have the range of social services that we want, if we had a broader understanding of our fiscal policy space at the federal level, there are no fiscal policy constraints that prevent us from having a society that works for us rather than against us. So I would say policy wise, we must have a federal job guarantee so that we don't leave the question of employment to the private sector. Businesses are incentivized to maximize profits. That's their fiduciary responsibility, which means they're gonna try to make the most profits by hiring the fewest people and pay them the least. We only way to counter that is to understand that the federal government can be the employer of last resort and hire 10 million, 20 million, 40 million Americans and provide them with a dignified job with benefits, a lot like what we experience in the nation's capital. Thank you. Um, did anyone else want to add to that or? I think, yes, I think um, uh, Dr. Coates is correct, but in order to making sure that we have enough jobs, we need to make sure that the children uh, and the community is educated. And that is putting more monies into schools uh, and making sure that there is the needs uh, so that the children can be educated, so that there are wraparound services uh, such as uh, counselors, uh, and the like to come into schools. Uh, as when we grew up back in the day, we didn't worry about a police coming into school because there was always somebody that would take you to the gym and say they were gonna tell your mom or, or, or your father. And so we need to make sure that 
schools and education uh, institutions are fully funded funds into HBCUs. And so that we can get those, um, the adequate education that is needed in order to obtain uh, particularly the jobs that are coming out, whether they're more high tech or the like. And if I may dovetail on that, an activity such as that would disrupt the cradle to prison pipeline, which is a profit center for some. And as it relates now, that's a high risk population for COVID-19, which a lot of things still uh, reflect back. The Rainbow Push Coalition is looking to get hand sanitizers and good care for those prisoners. Also, if you think of those that go into jail, they're in for about three days. So they can go in, get it, and come out and spread it to the community. So there are just so many benefits that the things that we're discussing, like education, as this was spoken by uh, Dr. Thomas, would help. And so the billions of dollars that are stated that we could just create and spend, we spent that on education. Again, another simple action that would solve a lot of problems. Raquel, um, many of the viewers are asking me for a book recommendation. Okay. I strongly recommend organizers read The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. Uh, it should be out now or coming out, The Deficit Myth, if you want a basic primer on monetary theory. Thank you for that. Um, I actually have so many questions too, um, especially to, to your points, um, uh, Dr. Coates, about creating you know, federal job guarantee and how we could do that within a capitalistic society. But I won't derail our conversation for the sake of time. Um, I'll go to Reverend Thomas. Thank you for the perfect segue into to opening up the conversation about education. So education is often talked about as the great equalizer, but we know that narrative is a myth. Um, and access to and quality of primary and secondary education in Black communities is hindered by inequalities in funding and resources, as you mentioned, um, and the lack of access to technology, a, predominant, a predominance of early career and underqualified teachers and school to prison pipeline. So could you um, kind of go more into de um, detail about what kind of policies do we need to confront these issues and ensure that from preschool through college, black children have the same opportunities for education as everyone else in this country? I think it's, it, it, you, you, you preference your question. It is about funding, as Dr. Brooks mentioned, and as Dr. Cope said, it is funding education. If if urban centers, urban schools had the same amount of money as our colleagues in suburbia, uh, then in fact, education would in fact be equal, but you cannot in fact reduce the amount of funds. Children leave our schools, go into uh, private schools, charter schools, money goes with them. They get kicked out of charter schools. They come back, but the money does not follow them. And you expect, and teachers to teach when classrooms are just four, you know, 50 and 55 persons in a classroom. And so uh, Dr. Brooks started out talking about the HEROES Act. We must continue to push that the HEROES Act uh, is, 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 is handled, uh, that it is voted on, on and, and it becomes effective. And even if that happens, we still do not have enough money that we need. And so we cannot continue to talk about in this midst of COVID-19, um, reducing teachers, because if we have to do social distancing and you already have an overcrowded school system and you then divide the children up, so no longer is there 40 students in a the class, there's 20, it would appear to me that that means that there has to be an extra teacher. And so in order to, to fit them, you cannot say uh, that leaving them at home and continue, continuing to uh, teach them using sort of technology when there is a digital divide in our community. And so funding into areas to make sure that the equipment and tools needed to educate our children uh, is there and that there is some sensitivity that we begin to uh, fund um, HBCUs. And so they have always been the pipeline of teachers into our communities. But if there's a student debt, and I must get a job teaching. I cannot go into teaching profession if teachers are not making adequate salaries enough for me to teach as well as pay for my student loan. And so we're saying get rid of student loan. If there's a student debt, just let's cancel that out and allow more 
of our black and brown uh, teachers uh, to come in, even with um, going into the medical profession or the like. If you go into some schools, you graduate from Howard University, you have to leave. You cannot go back into your communities because there is not the resource of the hospital there that can fund you. So you have to go to a big metropolitan city or somewhere and cannot even stay at home uh, in rural America and urban centers because there is not enough funds there uh, for you in order to pay the debt off and in fact, uh, do the job that you like. So I think the number, the key thing is HEROES Act, uh, actually become active on the local level, become school board members. School board members then become uh, state legislators and city council members and then become uh, congressional leaders. And so it is funding, adequate funding, adequate funding, adequate funding. Thank you for that. And um, so I, I appreciate your perspective and I, I completely agree that adequate funding will, will We'll, we'll do things in changing um, teacher retention, right? Like that's a huge issue within DC. Um, are there are there any other um, pieces of advice that you would give right now um, that we can do to really, you know, retain teachers um, outside of outside of the funding piece? And I say this because I have a cousin who is a second grade teacher, and just for your points right there, she is. She's a great teacher. We need teachers like her, but she's interested in, in in leaving the profession because she has to, you know, provide for herself, right? So, is there any piece of advice that you would give teachers right now to, you know, hold on? Well, okay. looking at also at mentors, uh, those that are already, I mean, uh, as an African American uh, clergy, uh, our churches are full of retired teachers, and so bringing some of those teachers back. Uh, and allow them in order to mentor your cousin and young teachers to keep them sort of in the in the pipeline and become more active uh, sort of that way. And I think we have to start also at the college and university levels uh, and begin to let them know, mentor them as they are going through the teaching profession. Uh, as we do doctors and lawyers, everybody gets to, to, to do this little training before they become a doctor. You can't just graduate get your diploma in your hand and immediately set up a practice. You must go through a process. And so uh, we recommend also that and and as, as churches, particularly black churches, let's begin to utilize those that are within our congregations and ask them to be more mentors uh, to young teachers that are coming out. Thank you. And so we've covered a lot in this hour, but um, to begin wrapping up, I want to ask you all, um, so you've all shared a, a wide range of actions that need to be taken. Um, how can we, one, strategically pursue our laundry list of, of policy needs? Two, how can we begin to mobilize Black communities to advocate for these policy changes? And then three, how can we ensure that their voices and experiences are going to be taken seriously when the demands are made? I'll do that. I think you go to the polls. Uh, you got you have to vote at every level and not just every four years for the president. You must vote for the mayor. You must vote for your state elected officials, those that have your best interests, uh, those uh, at, at every level. And then you must participate. You must fill out your census. Uh, because in order for the redistribution of economics in our federal government to get there, we must be counted so that we can, in fact, get the monies into our communities at the very level that we need them. And then participate uh, in organizations. I think there was a, re uh, a previous panel that discussed whether it's NAACP, Black Lives Matter, Black Youth 100, whatever organization fits sort of the purview of your interest, support them because they become advocates for them. Black state legislators, Hispanic state legislators, Black mayors uh, continue to be supportive of their issues, but you cannot sit at home and talk to each other. You cannot be on social media showing up about what you ate yesterday and what someone else had to dress on. You must continue to voice and use uh, social media as an opportunity to advance your issues as you begin, because elected officials are looking at 
social media links. They're looking at Facebook. They're keeping up with what persons say in our community. And so I think as they did in the 60s, they hit the streets. It was not easy for them. They walked across the bridge. It was not easy for them. And so we must begin to be uncomfortable and continue to progress in the, in our movement. I would certainly countersign on that. I would say we need to gain knowledge. I like the fact that people are asking uh, Dr. Coates, what do I need to read to get more information? We really do need to gain knowledge, but knowledge without power is useless. And power without knowledge is reckless. We're seeing that with some of those in power right now. So with the knowledge that you gain, use your power, advocate, support, find a way to support, find a way that feels good to support. You have to get out there and do something because in the end, after all is said and done, more is said than done. So you need to get out there and do something. And you'll know in your heart, you will know in your heart if what you did was the right thing, because we all generally, your, your brain thinks, but the heart is where the soul is. So if you if you do what you know and feel is right, I believe that there will be activity. And when we unify around that, is that that global action of, of the black people, at least in the United States, working together, we will get somewhere. Vote. I can go. Um, I, I agree with what everyone's saying. I think um, for folks who are maybe this is your first time going to protests, first time getting active, I would just remind you that one protest is one prong of a multi-prong strategy to build political power, cultural power, and economic power. And so, yes, we love that people are in the streets. We should be in the streets. Changes get made when we hit the streets. But um, when um, we stop being in the streets, because ultimately, at some point, we won't always be in the streets, um, join an organization and start getting active we need millions of people to be involved in this fight for black lives. Um, we're not going to be able to get closer to freedom without everybody's involvement. So I just wanna remind people, protesting is amazing, it's critical, it's powerful, and it's only one part of this larger thread of how we change policy, how we change our candidates, and how we hold people accountable. And I, I would just um, say that I would just build on the comment about accountability. Um, I noticed the way in which many entertainers and influencers have been using their voice and their platform to ask politicians what is their agenda for the black community. I think that's well intentioned, but I think that we need to, to take a different posture. Rather than asking candidates what their plan is for the black community, we need to be defining what you know that plan and that agenda is and then hold them accountable to that. There's no other special interest group, whether it's conservative evangelicals, the Latinx or immigrant community, um, LGBTQ friends. No one goes to politicians and asks them, what is your plan for our group? They define what the public policy priorities ought to be and they hold those politicians accountable. We have not done that in a way. It's one thing that I find inspiring about the defund movement and because they are defining what the ask is, and they're holding politicians accountable to that. And I think that's what we need to do. Hey, well, thank you all. I'm being signaled to wrap up. So I wanted to thank you all again for being here and sharing. Um, thank you to Allen Cathedral and Reverend Stephen Green for, for orchestrating this and bringing us all together. Um, I believe we are in a truly unique place to radically reimagine our communities. Um, and, and I'd encourage everyone to continue these conversations um, and continue to, to push for our needs and to be put, um, put continue to, to push that our needs are really put into concrete policy agendas, um, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level as well. So thank you all again, um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Raquel, and thank you, panelists. This was awesome. Yes, thank you, Raquel. Thank you thank for hosting you. this. Thank you. Alan.